a series of tests and, and the doctor asked a series of questions that this doctor could determine how long you would live. So the doctor, I mean the man said, I want to know that. So he went to the doctor, he went through all the tests and, and sat for a long interview, a series of questions. And then the doctor called with the results, but the man was at work, so the wife took the phone call and, and the wife said, well, doctor, what, what did you find out? How long is my husband going to live? And he said, well, he's going to live a long time, but only if you do these certain things. You have to um, cook for him a healthy, nutritious, delicious meal every single day. When he gets home from work, he cannot do anything. He just needs to sit in the chair and have you just wait on him hand and foot. It's really important that he has no stress at all. So, so if you're feeling disgruntled about something or unhappy, you cannot tell him. You just have to keep it to yourself. And if you do all those things, he's going to live like over 100. He's going to live a really, really long time. The husband comes home and the wife says, well, the doctor's office called today. And the husband was like, well, tell me, what did he say? How long am I going to live? The wife said, well, he said, you're going to die. <laughs> if someone could tell you your future, what's it worth to you? How much would you pay if you had to pay someone to tell you what your future is? Did you know that Americans, we in the United States, spend, I could not believe this, $300 million a year on psychic hotlines? Can I just say, in case you didn't know, that there is God's power and these enemies' power and psychic and horoscope and all that kind of fall into the enemy's camp? And not only is it the enemy's camp, but it's not truth. It's a lie. So... You know someone who's spent part of that $300 million on a psychic hotline. <laughs> we want to know what's in front of us. We want to know what's out there. We want to know what's in my future. What's my life going to look like? If there's some things I could do that would guarantee happiness and guarantee a certain outcome, how can I know what those are? But for a lot of us, we look in the rearview mirror and we wish that we could go back and do it differently. We wish we could date differently, marry differently, spend differently, parent differently. That when we look forward, we can't help but look back with regret. And, and the thing is, God doesn't give do-overs. I can't go back and redo some things in my life. So maybe you're sitting here and you go, wow, I'd love to have a do-over. God doesn't give do-overs, but he does do makeovers. And we can't change what's back here, but we can do something about here forward. And if you think I've done something that's totally ruined God's plan for my life, I missed it here. Can I just tell you this morning that you're not that powerful? If my one decision had the power to change God's plan, then, then I am in the driver's seat, then I'm more powerful. God can take our mistakes and redeem them and make something beautiful out of them. God can take that past thing that you look back at and you regret and you wish you could do over, and he says, how about we start today and we do a makeover? And let me show you the plan that I have for your life. Because life is not a series of, of unrelated decisions. It's not like, well, this happened and this, this happened. But life is a path. Each one of us, whether you know this or not, believe this or not, you picked a path. And how you got to where you are today, if you just look in the rearview mirror, you'll see it's, it's a series of choices and a path that you went down that you ended up here today. And a lie that we often believe is, well, it'll, it'll just somehow work out. But that's a lie. Because the path that I'm on is a path that I've been walking all this time. But today can be a day of taking a different path and taking a different course. Because you and I, by our decisions, by our choices, we choose 
what direction we go. Because direction, you've heard this Andy Stanley quote, my husband's quoted a couple times, direction, not intention, determines destination. In other words, I can intend with all my heart to do something, but if my direction isn't in that order, in that way, then I'm not going to end up there. Like, I can say I want a close relationship with God, but if I don't spend time with him, if I fill my time with Facebook or, or other media or television or video games, I'm not going to end up at that destination. Or I can say, you know what, I really want to get in shape. I want to adopt a healthy, healthy lifestyle. But if I just sit on the couch and walk, watch Netflix and eat nachos, I'm not going to end up there. Even though that's my intent, it's not my direction. Or I may say, you know what, I want to be, I want to live a long, healthy life, and I want to invest in my grandchildren. But if I live unhealthy and my life is going to be shortened, it doesn't matter how much I want it if I don't point myself in that direction. Or, or you may say, as a, maybe you're a couple here and you have kids, and you say, you know what, I want my kids to develop a relationship with God. I want them to have godly friends. But then we choose to miss church often or miss activities for them often because they're in sports and all those other activities. And we end up in a place we never intended because of the direction, not the intention. We pick a path, and then what happens? When that path leads to its logical conclusion, we blame God or we blame other people because we ended up on the very path that we picked. I remember when our kids were growing up, my husband would ask them often, and they hated this. Do you remember this? They'd say, well, should I do this or should I do this? Or I want to go to a party at this friend's house. And, and my husband would look at them and say, what do you think is the wise thing to do? They hated that. Because they wanted us to just tell them, then if it didn't work out or if it was bad, then, well, my mom and dad said I could, and it didn't end up well. But he'd say, what's the wise thing to do? And most of the time, they knew what the wise thing was, even though they were asking for the unwise thing. Parents, it's not our job just to tell our kids, don't do this and do do this. Our job is to teach them to listen to the voice of God and to walk in wisdom. For us, that's our job. Not just for somebody, I can't tell you how many times somebody sits in my office and says, just tell me what to do. Well, I'm not going to do that. It's your life. But I'll pray with you, and we'll consult what God has to say on this and look at what's the wise thing to do instead of just telling someone what to do. Proverbs 27, verse 12. It's a powerful verse. It says, The prudent, or the wise, see danger and take refuge, but the simple keep going and suffer for it. See, there's two kinds of people. There's the prudent or the wise person, and there's the simple or the foolish person. Both of those people in this verse see the same thing. It's what they do about it. The prudent person sees danger and says, I need to do something different. The simple or the foolish see danger and just say, ah, oh, it'll work out. I'll just keep going. It's kind of like when we see behaviors in our life that aren't good turning into bad habits, the prudent person says, I, I need to do something about that. I need to change that behavior. Where the, the, the simple or the foolish just keep going. We understand that there's a, a cause and effect. We want to be wisdom chasers. I want to be a wisdom chaser. So looking ahead and seeing there's danger. If I keep on this path of spending, I'm going to end up in a place I don't want to be. It says the wise makes a different decision where the foolish just go on. When the, I love this Andy Stanley quote, when the inevitable becomes the unavoidable, it is not unusual for us to begin to point fingers at God. Can't tell you how many times I've heard someone end up in a place they never intended to be. Well, why did God let this happen? But for most of us, if we were to retrace our steps, we would look and say, I was on a path towards this because it was the inevitable becoming the unavoidable, and I chose that path. Foolishness comes naturally to us, doesn't it? I mean, just look at, you don't have to teach a child 
to lie. You don't have to teach a child to, to hide or to shade the truth or to, to manipulate a situation. That's our natural bent is foolishness. That's why the, the Bible says over and over to chase wisdom, seek after wisdom. It has to be intentional. It's not just, oh, whatever will be, will be. But no, I choose wisdom's path, wisdom for your future. Some have said, and I've heard this said, chase your dreams. Some of us have chased our dreams and ended up somewhere we never intended to be. Because that's incorrect. You don't chase your dreams, you chase after God and his purpose. And in him is where you find what you're built for, what your dream is. I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know if you find yourself in need of a makeover. or Maybe you've been on the wrong path, pointed in the wrong direction. Or maybe you're facing a decision and there's no clear answer. And you're like, I need to know what to do. I need to know which way to go. I believe God wants to speak a word to you today. And you may look at your path and say, I've got more road behind me than I do ahead of me. Or I'm just starting out. Doesn't matter where you're at. If you're here and you're breathing, God has purpose for you. And as long as he has purpose, I think it's important to find out, God, what's your direction? What's your, what's your way that you want me to walk? I don't want to just end up anywhere. My husband and I were, went for a drive yesterday, and we did something we don't normally do. Usually we have a purpose. We know where we're going. And we said, let's just drive. And so we get to a place. He said, which way do you want to turn, right or left? I'm like, ah, oh, right. So we turn right. We come to another. I, he'd say, which way do you want to turn? I said, why pick last time? You pick this time. That's kind of fun. It's fun for a drive. But how many of us, that's how we go through life. And then we end up in a place we never intended to be because we just kind of did a Sunday drive through our life. I just want to look at one verse or two verses, one little passage this morning in Proverbs about wisdom for our future. But before we do that, would you pray with me? Father, I know that you see all and know all, God, and you know each one of us by name this morning. God, you know our situations, you know what we're facing, you know where we've been, you know where we're going. Holy Spirit, I ask you to speak to us. God, I know that there's those of us in this place who, God, we look over our shoulder with a huge amount of regret, and we don't see any way for you to redeem what lies ahead. But God, I thank you that you are a master and making beautiful things out of broken things. And God, I pray today would be a turning point for some of us in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, if you turn in your Bibles with me, or hopefully it'll be on the screens, we've had a little bit of technical difficulty this morning, so thank you for your grace and your understanding. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. I think most of us, if we don't know it, we've at least heard it. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge or submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. Four simple points this morning. Trust, don't lean, submit, and right path. First one is trust. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Now we've heard that and we say, oh yeah, I need to, I need to trust God. But I, I want to give you a little bit of, picture, of a picture of what trust looks like. Tim, would you help me out? Come on up here. Would you just, um, up next to the screen, just lay on your stomach as though I were putting you under arrest and I said, down on the ground. That is trust. And that's actually the word picture of what trust means because he is very vulnerable, right? He can't really fight back. I won't hurt you, I promise. But he's in a very vulnerable, trusting, can't fight for his own way position. You can, you can get up. Thank you very much. Give Tim a hand. <clears throat> Couldn't ask just anybody to do that, but it had to be somebody who uh, is in shape. Because um, <clears throat> some of us, we'd get down there and it would be a very, very long time before we could get back up. That's why I, didn't, I don't do my own stunts. Um, but the picture of trust is a, a picture of being laid out before God. God, I trust you with all of me. I place myself in a vulnerable, 
powerless position and I say, I trust you. Now, I've heard people say, well, I can't trust God because I never learned trust growing up. Really? If you didn't learn trust growing up, you're sitting in a chair and you're trusting that it will hold you. You trusted as you got in your car and came here that the road wouldn't collapse. We put our trust in things every single day that we don't know anything about. When I flip the switch and electricity comes on, I, I trust that that's going to happen. I don't even think about it. Even though I may not have learned trust growing up, I know God's character and who he says he is, and he can be trusted. And my job is just to be vulnerable and fully his. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. It's important that we don't trust our heart, but we trust God with our heart. You know, the world says, what is, what is your heart telling you? That's what you need. Just, just go with what's in your heart. Well, the Bible says the heart is wicked, deceitful. Because our heart says, well, I want this, so therefore, that's what I'm going to go for. But the, the Bible doesn't say trust your heart. It says trust God with your heart. Lord, what do you want? What do you want for me? Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. The second part of that is don't lean. Don't lean to your own understanding. That, that picture there of leaning is to prop up. Most of us, I would say, myself included, have made decisions propped up with our own understanding, with our own way of looking at things, with our own way of processing information, with what I think is the best thing for me. I want to just talk about some common myths when it comes to God's direction for our life. First one, this is my favorite, my personal favorite. If it's meant to be, it will be. Okay, how many of you ever said that? Come on. How many of you ever heard someone say that? All right, there we go. If it's meant to be, it will be. That's a myth. That's not truth. That's like, I'm going to get in my car, and I'm going to head west. Honey, I'm directionally challenged, so if I'm going to head west, I'm going to go to California. Well, I don't. Okay, it's that way. I'm going to head west. I'm going to end up in California if I just keep driving. That's like, well, if I'm meant to end up in New York, then I'll just end up in New York. It'll just magically happen. We end up wherever we point ourselves where we're going. I can't live a life on the edge, full of compromise and not submitted to God, and expect my life to be blessed and full of joy because that's not the direction I placed myself. I can't expect me to be a disciplined person if I don't ever point myself in the direction of discipline, but I live an undisciplined life. It's not if it's meant to be, it will be. It'll be what I choose and the path I take will be the direction I end up. You got here this morning because you pointed your car towards here. You didn't end up here because, well, it was meant to be. It was just meant to be. I just got in my car and said, take me wherever you want. No, you pointed your car here. Second myth. If there's trouble, then it means that it's not God's will. If there's trouble, then that must not be God's will. I can't tell you how many times I've heard this said. Well, I felt like God said this, but it didn't end up like I thought it was supposed to. I prayed about this new job. I, I felt sure that it was God's will, so I took it, but, but it's hard. And I don't like my boss. And I don't enjoy it. Or, you know what, we prayed before we got married, and I really felt like he was the one or she was the one, and, and we got married, and now we fight all the time. So maybe it wasn't God's will. Because we believe the lie that if it's God's will, it will be easy. Where did we get that? Jesus promised in this world, you're going to have tribulation. That the, the testing of our faith works patience. That sometimes we end up in a desert. Sometimes it's because of our own doing. 
And sometimes it's because God leads us there. Jesus, after he was filled with the Holy Spirit, was led into the desert. Now, I don't always understand, but I know that God works in us in the midst of the desert, in the midst of the trial, in the midst of the tough time. The saying, don't doubt in the dark what God showed you in the light. If you've done all those things and you've taken a step and you're walking a direction and yet there's trouble, don't be so quick to jump ship and say, well, this must not have been God's will. Because it's a myth that God's will means that it will be easy. If that were true, Jesus would have never gone to the cross. He would have never taken that road. He would have never bore your sins and my sins. But he walked in obedience, trusting that, Father, not your will but mine. Because sometimes God's will is hard and difficult. Sometimes we may have taken that step in God's direction, but we didn't take care of where we were at. Like we didn't, maybe that job was God's will, God's direction, but we've been a really poor employee, and now we're suffering the consequences of our actions. Or maybe your marriage, I, I've heard this one more times than I care to count. Well, I'm sure it was God's will, but we fight so much that I'm not sure anymore. Maybe I married the wrong person. That's kind of like if you buy a new car and you never change the oil, you never put air in the tires, you never take care of it, and then it ends up breaking down, you get mad at the manufacturer, well, that was just a lousy car. I can't believe they sold me a lousy car. Well, you didn't do anything to take care of it. It's kind of like me and my gardening experience. I planted everything. That's all you have to do, right? <laughs> you don't have to pull weeds or water or anything like that. It's a myth. If there's trouble, it means it not, it's not God's will. Is this myth or truth? Good equals God, bad equals not God. It's kind of a cousin of the one before. If it's good, it's God. If this makes sense to me, see, that's leaning to our own understanding. If this appears good, then that must be God. But if it appears bad, that can't possibly be God. Trials are the opportunity for you and I to develop trust muscles. Sometimes it looks bad, but it's God. Think of Jesus when he got in the boat with the disciples. He was going to the other side, and a storm came up. What was their first thing they said? Bad? This is not God. God, where are you? Jesus, why are you sleeping? Where, what about all this? Don't you care that we die? How many times do we get in the middle of a situation and we say, God, where are you? Don't you care? I'm dying. Now, Jesus was there the whole time. He got in the boat, said, take me to the other side. He led them into that storm. You may be in a storm. And you say, okay, this doesn't make any sense. Because it's bad, God is still in the midst of that, even when it's bad. Doesn't mean it's not God's will. Doesn't mean he's left you. Doesn't mean you missed out. He's still with you. We lean to our own understanding. Last one. If God doesn't give me what I'm asking for, I must be doing something wrong. If people say, well, you pray for me to get this job. Well, what if that job is not what God has for you? What if the thing that you want is not God's will? So is it better to pray for the thing you want or to say, Father, not my will, but yours? That whole, try, I trust you. I'm submitted. I'm surrendered. I'm vulnerable. I am not in control. You are in control. So rather than, God, this job, it has great benefits, it's a raise, it will be what I enjoy. But God, who knows the end from the beginning, who knows your future, says, that isn't it. Sometimes a closed door is God's protection. And sometimes when there's a closed door and we don't get what we want, we start kicking at it and we get mad at God. When all along he's been saying, child, I closed that door to protect you. 
You don't know what's on the other side of that door, but I do. So I've closed it, even though it's what you wanted and you thought you knew best. I closed it because I know what's on the other side and I'm protecting you. Story of my, my nephew, his dream was to uh, be in the Green Berets. He was training for that. He, he was doing all the things he, and I don't really understand, but doing all the things he needed to do to be a Green Beret. And I know one of the things he had to do was um, jump out of planes. Well, on one of his jumps, he severely hurt his ankle. So he had surgery, he went through rehab to build it up because he was sure that God's will for his life was Green Beret. It was a desire of his heart, it was his dream, he was going for it. Well, they finally said no, because you are not in top physical condition and you won't ever be, so that door slammed in his face. He was angry, he was disappointed. The thing that he had wanted that seemed, it wasn't like he wanted a bad thing. The thing that he had wanted, that he had spent all these years pursuing, the door just shut in his face. So he had to go a different route. He ended up doing something that he's doing today that he absolutely loves. If you were to ask him, I was texting with him yesterday, he is doing what he was built for. Now, had God not shut that door, he would have never experienced that. He would have never known what he's doing is what he was made for. And he's good at it, really, really good at it. Sometimes we're pursuing something and we're so certain that this is God's will. We're so certain that this is the thing that would make me happy. This is the thing that would fulfill me. And maybe people say to you or the door closes and you get mad at God, I get mad at God. And God says, I got something better if you'll just trust me. It's that position of, God, I lay it down. Not my will, but yours. I surrender. That's what wise people do is surrender. Because we're not going to lean to our own understanding that I know better than God. God, if you would just listen to me and get with the program. Because I know what I want, right? Right? So I'm asking all these people to pray for what I want, forgetting to uh, submit it to him. The second way that we lean to our own understanding is by doing it on our own. Scripture says over and over to seek counsel because the problem is you and I only see what we see. See, I only know what I know. I don't know what I don't know. And until I ask for counsel, I ask for outside help, I'm only going on what I know. And there isn't a one of us in this room that knows everything. There's some of us that think we do. But, <laughs> but no one of us knows everything. And the thing is, you don't know what you don't know. You only know what you know. And if I make all my own decisions based on what I know, I'm missing this huge thing that I don't know. But I don't know what I don't know. So I have to ask for counsel. I just want to go through a few scriptures in Proverbs. You've been taking your daily proverb? Proverbs 1.5 says, Let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance. Proverbs 12.15, The way of the fools seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. Proverbs 13.10, where there is strife, there is pride. little aside here, if you find yourself always um, arguing, whether on your job or with your friends or with your family or with your spouse, probably a little bit of pride going on there. That's free. Proverbs 13.10, but wisdom is found in those who take advice. Proverbs 19.20, listen to advice and accept discipline. At the end, you'll be counted among the wise. Proverbs 11.14, for lack of guidance, a nation falls. But victory is won through many advisors. Or the King James says, in the multitude of counselors, there's safety. Proverbs 15.22, plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. Do you notice a pattern here? 
The wise listen and take advice. Listen and take advice. What's the biggest thing that prohibits us from seeking counsel? Pride. I don't want anybody to tell me what I'm supposed to do. This is my life. I can choose what I want. You know what? And you can. Because the foolish person does what's right in their own eyes. But the wise seeks counsel. See, before, before us, we have a choice. Each and every one of us. I can be wise or I can be foolish. That's why I have a free will. I can choose the foolish route. Or I can choose the wise route to seek counsel. Most of us, what we do is we make a decision and then we ask counsel of people who we know will agree with our decision. That's not seeking counsel. Seeking counsel is before you make the decision. We designed our pre-marriage program that couples would come to us before they're engaged, before a ring and a date. Because we found that if you come and go through pre-marriage counseling before there's a ring and a date, you're much more likely to receive counsel, to look at things honestly, to be open. Because some of us, in our choice of a spouse, don't make the wisest choices. And seeking counsel is a healthy thing. Before you make major life decisions, it's a wise thing to go seek counsel. In the multitude of counselors, there's safety because you don't know what you don't know. And God, more than likely, has someone in your sphere, someone across your path, that will give you perspective that you didn't see. Because when we're in the middle of things, we're emotionally invested in it. And so we think with our heart. We think with our emotions. We make that decision. But someone outside that can see what we cannot see. We lean to our own understanding when we ignore counsel. Two things about counsel. You never outgrow your need for seeking counsel. You don't get to a certain age and go, whoop, then I don't need it. And second, you'll never reach your full potential without tapping into the wisdom of others. I need other people's wisdom. You need other people's wisdom. And we won't be all that we can be in Jesus without seeking counsel from other people. As wisdom chasers, seek counsel. Don't lean to your own understanding. Third one, all your ways. Acknowledge or submit. See, well, I think the word acknowledge, we think, you know how people just kind of walk by each other and do the nod? You know, that's acknowledging. <laughs> we think, in all your ways, acknowledge him. Yeah, I got I acknowledge it, God. But the word really is submit. In all our ways, submit. In all our ways. Everything about my life. See, we, we like to compartmentalize our life. Well, this is my spiritual life. This is my work life. This is my home life. This is my entertainment life. This is my fun life. This is my extended family life. This is my free time life. He says, in all your ways, submit to him. In all those ways. This is my hidden life. This is my secret life. Because the, the habits that I develop in my secret life, they put me on a path and they spill over in every single area. And it's a lie from the enemy that we can keep that compartmentalized. I can make these compromises and do these things in secret and still be this with my family or friends or in my spiritual life, and the two don't, don't blend. And that's deception, because he wants us to submit every part of our life to him. In all of our ways, submit to him. In all of our ways. See, our problem is not lack of information. Our problem is submission. How many times when we're faced with a decision, it isn't more people's opinion that we need, is submitting ourselves to God and then seeking wise counsel and saying, God, whatever you want, that's what I want. Whatever you desire for my life, that's what I desire. That's what I want. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean to your own understanding, your own way of looking at things. In all your ways, submit to him. And then the last part of that verse, and worship team, you can come to the platform. 
It says, and then he will make your paths straight. Now, when we hear paths straight, I don't know about you, but I think straight. I mean, it's pretty simple. I think easy, clear of obstacles, no detours. He'll make the path straight. But actually, that word more exactly means he'll make the path obvious. We won't have to guess about which way to go if we've done those other things. Trust in him. That position of vulnerability of, Lord, I submit all that I am to you. I surrender control. I lean not to my own understanding. I'm not going to just go with what I think is the best thing or go without counsel, but I'm going to seek counsel. And I'm going to lean on you rather than prop myself up with what I think is the right way. And then in all of my ways, in every part of my life, I'm going to submit it to you. And then you say, you're going to make the path obvious. Most of us, what we want is we want him to make the path obvious, and then we'll let him know whether we want to follow it or not. But the path is only obvious if we do all those things. And sometimes that obvious path, we only see it as we followed him and kept our eyes on him, and then we look in the rearview mirror, and then we see, God, you directed my steps. I didn't even know how I ended up where I ended up. All I know is I was trusting you and following you. It's kind of like when you play follow the leader, you're trusting the person in front of you to take you where you need to go. And that's really what wisdom for your future is all about is taking his hand, letting him lead. And then we end up in a place that he designed for us, and it's a good place. Some of us need to get out of the driver's seat and let him drive. Let him lead, and we'll follow. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? I was, uh, just keep your heads bowed, eyes closed. As I was praying this morning, I, uh, I just sensed that there's some in here that you felt like you've taken a wrong turn, and so you're stuck. And I sense the Lord wants to remind you that it's not too late. It's never too late if you've made a wrong turn to to make a right turn, to get back on the right path, to submit your heart to him, to trust him, to follow him. Because he's in the business of makeovers, of making beautiful things out of broken things. But I also know that there's some of us in here that we've never committed our life to him. We've talked about him, we know him, we've acknowledged him, we've tipped our head, but we've never submitted our life to him. If you're here in this place and you say, you know what, things aren't right between God and I. I know I'm not following him, I'm not on that path, but today I want to be. I want to be a follower of Jesus where he's in charge and I'm not. With eyes closed, so it's just a moment between you and God. If that's you, you say, I want to follow him beginning today would you just raise your hand I just want to pray for you say I want to follow him beginning today yeah yeah several of us in this place have said yep that's me Lord for every person who has their hand raised and say today they want to get on that path Father I pray that you would do a fresh work in their heart that they would choose to follow you today from this day forward, not going to the right or the left, but following you with all their heart. In Jesus' name. Would you stand with me as we close? There were several that raised their hand and said, I want to get on that path. But I know there's, there's some of us in this place that we recognize that we need a makeover. <laughs> that we've been in some area of our life doing it our way. 
may be a small thing, it may be a big thing, it doesn't matter. Today's the day to say, you know what, I've been intending on this direction, but I've been walking this direction. And beginning today, I want to walk in the right direction. I want to change directions. There's nothing wrong with asking for directions and turning around when you find yourself on a road you didn't want to end up on. So if you raised your hand a little bit earlier, I want to begin to follow Jesus, or you just say, you know what, I need, God's just knocking on the door of my heart, and there's some area of my life that I need a makeover. I need to change directions. I need to get on a different path. If that's you, I just, I just want us to take a moment and solidify that, and I want to pray for you. So if you would just come to the altar as the worship team sings, and we're just going to pray one for another and say, God, would you do a fresh work in my heart? Lori, as you were talking about the makeover, do-over thing, church, you need to hear this. It's incredible about God. My wife and I, we often joke about our marriage. And, and, and I tell her, you had to be the most stupid woman in the world to marry me. I mean, I was that kind of shape. And in the flesh, it's easy. Man, we need to do it. We just need to go. You need to choose someone else, and I need to choose someone else. But now we look at our lives, and we thank God in the midst of our error, the blessing that comes from the makeover. And in some of your lives today, you think the answer is a do-over. You are convinced. You are convinced. You are convinced that if we had a chance to do it over, it would be better. And God said, no. No, you, if you do it over, you can't have the blessing that I have for you. Right where you are today with your mistakes, with your errors, with your pain, God wants to give you a makeover, right? And you could not do it better if you did it yourself. That's what Lord is talking about. In our own minds, we, can, we have convinced ourselves that we can make it better. And God is encouraging us today to trust Him that in the makeover, it will be better than any do-over you could do. I don't know what the situation is. I don't know where you are, but in your head, you're convinced that God can't make it better, that God's grace is not enough. You've convinced yourself that God is not enough, and God is inviting us today to trust Him, to lean upon Him, to acknowledge Him, and then He will show you how obvious it is for us this morning. I'm encouraging His Lord, just respond to Him this morning. Regardless of where you are, regardless of what the challenge is, regardless of how ugly it is and it appears, God wants to do a makeover in our lives this morning. Respond to him. Why don't you come and let's find a place to pray. No matter if it's you want to give your life to him or you're saying, I need a fresh start. I need a different path. I need a makeover.